So you're getting it in your water, you're getting it in your air, you're getting it in your food. And uh, it's extremely poisonous, in my opinion. And the government thinks it's safe. That's the critical problem. The government thinks it's safe. Welcome back to the Regenerative Health Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Max Gulhane. And in this episode, I talk to Dr. Stephanie Senov, who is a senior research scientist at the MIT Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. Now, Stephanie is a highly accomplished scientist and investigator um, with degrees in biophysics, electrical engineering, and computer science from MIT. She's published over 170 peer-reviewed works. In recent years, Dr. Senef has focused her interests on the effects of the herbicide glyphosate on human health. And she's recently released a, an excellent book called Toxic Legacy, which details the evidence against this uh, very widely used agricultural herbicide um, that is being sprayed on, on commodity crops, uh, sometimes multiple times before harvests. In this interview, we cover the four key mechanisms by which glyphosate is damaging human health. Um, we cover the fascinating synergies between the effects of deuterium and glyphosate, and why uh, Stephanie believes glyphosate is chiefly responsible for the autism epidemic that we're witnessing. We finish the, the discussion with uh, a hope for a bright future of regenerative farming. If you're enjoying this podcast, as always, share it out, and particularly to those maybe in farming communities where glyphosate is being sprayed and the decision to use glyphosate is being made. Any reviews as well on the podcast platforms are much appreciated. Now, onto the podcast. Hi, Stephanie. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Good. Thank you. So can you tell the listeners what what, what is glyphosate and, and why is it such a problem? Right. Glyphosate is an herbicide. It's, it's a, the active ingredient in the pervasive herbicide Roundup. A lot of people know about Roundup. They use it to kill the dandelions in the yard. Uh, it's pervasive, absolutely pervasive in the food supply, glyphosate widely contaminated especially in the processed foods but pretty much um, you know lots and lots of foods even organics come up with some glyphosate much less than um, others organics can't use glyphosate so that an important message is to buy certified organic when you shop at the grocery store that's a way to reduce your glyphosate exposure because i think we're getting a lot of it from the food we're also getting it from the air um of course if you live near the farm where they're spraying it then you're going to breathe it in um, the water supply, I found, I got samples of rain in Cambridge at MIT, and um, my friend Anthony Samso found glyphosate in those rain, rain samples. So it's in the rainwater. It's, it's, so you're getting it in your water, you're getting it in your air, you're getting it in your food. And uh, it's extremely poisonous, in my opinion. And the government thinks it's safe. That's the critical problem. The government thinks it's safe. And Monsanto did these studies. So Monsanto was the producer, has the patent for use, using glyphosate to kill weeds. Um, they created all these GMO Roundup Ready crops, uh, GMO technology to put in a, a, a microbial enzyme that protects them from glyphosate. So you could just spray the crop. It doesn't die, but it soaks up the glyphosate and gets it into its tissues. You can't wash it off. And so uh, these are GMO core crops of the processed food industry, corn, soy, canola, sugar beets, uh, alfalfa. Those are all GMO Roundup Ready crops in the United States. Most of the crops grown are, are Roundup Ready. And then you get glyphosate in all the derivative foods from those crops, which are, of course, really substantial in processed foods. And then there's also there's a lot of foods that uh, crops that are sprayed right before harvest, <clears throat> particularly wheat, for example. We have an epidemic in gluten intolerance. I think it's directly connected to the glyphosate in wheat. And I, I know how glyphosate can cause gluten intolerance in the wheat. And then oats and barley and, and uh, legumes, uh, garbanzo beans, chickpeas, hummus sky high levels of glyphosate because they're sprayed right before harvest. So it's all over the food supply. We're all being poisoned. It's causing an alarming rise in a huge list of diseases. And I've done a lot of correlation studies looking at uh, over time, the rise in these diseases and the rise in glyphosate usage on core crops. Nancy Swanson and I collaborated on a number of papers. Uh, we have you know, dozens of, of plots of different conditions that are going up dramatically exactly in step with glyphosate. I think it is a major contributor to the autism epidemic. It, by certainly the primary contributor, not the only thing that's causing the epidemic, but I think it's primary. So it's extremely important to be aware of it, and it's extremely important to try to avoid it as much as possible to stay healthy. 
Yeah, and and look, a lot of my listeners are in rural areas or have some contact with rural Australia here, and glyphosate is used in in monocrop farming um, pervasively, as you've just mentioned. Yes, and 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 it's used prior to um, prior to spraying planting a field in order to kind of knock down weeds. But mm-hmm. as you also mentioned, it's it's used in desiccation, and, yes, and people exactly. people. People look at you funny when, when you tell them that um, the farmer is spraying their um, food in order to help them harvest it with this, this, this chemical to literally kill the plant before that they, they exactly. can. Exactly. Yeah, and and they look problem. at you with a, a funny, funny look, but that's the reality of what's happening. Yes, and it took me a while to realize. I, I saw the gluten intolerance. You know, as I was looking at glyphosate, that I was aware of the, of the uh, um, GMO crops and wheat is not a GMO crop. We haven't, you know, no one has embraced it. I mean, they've produced it, but the farmers don't want it. But they don't want it because they want to spray the wheat right before harvest to kill it. If it's GMO, they can't kill it anymore. So they're using it right before harvest, which means that wheat is showing up with substantially high levels of glyphosate contamination. That means bread, that means gluten intolerance. I mean, it's really, I realized, in fact, I wrote a, a paper together with Anthony Samso on that issue gluten intolerance connecting it to glyphosate because of that contamination in the wheat. Yeah, and and I guess it's a great point, and I really want to put a flag in the sand for the rest of the interview, which is the absurdity of the modern world that we're living in, where it's normal to spray our food crops with a toxic herbicide prior to. I mean that that that's the degree. That's where we're at, and yeah, it we can say it's so insane. It's insane. It, it, it's part of industrialization and all this kind of thing, but it's it to me, it's a topsy turvy world where that that's kind of normal and. Again, people don't um, realize how, uh, or they get confused about this GMO issue. But I, as you you've talked about extensively, I think the key issue with GMOs is that they're um, engineered to endure being sprayed with glyphosate. Exactly, but they don't. But you don't need GMO to have glyphosate. That's the thing. People think, oh, I'm buying non-GMO. That's safe. That's not true, because mm. non-GMO. Some of the highest levels are showing up in non-GMO crops because they're being sprayed right before harvest. Mm. The the I think it, it would be great to make a distinction for people, and um, because Roundup was the original product that um, that kind of used glyphosate, but um, obviously Roundup contained other products as well. So, in, in terms of talking about your research and talking about the effect on human health, are you mostly concerned about the glyphosate per se, or is it the whole formulation of the well, herbicide? Glad you pointed that out. It gets uh, Seralini in France. He, he's done a number of papers, uh, a lot of studying of glyphosate and the formulations, and he's determined that the other ingredients are also very, very toxic. And they're acutely toxic. Glyphosate is more insidious. It's what I call it is insidiously cumulatively toxic. But these other ingredients are acutely toxic in Roundup, for example. And they add these surfactants that enable the, round, uh, the glyphosate to get up into the cells, both in the case of our bacteria and in the case of the crops. They want the, the glyphosate to get in and they use the surfactants to help that happen. But then they have these chemicals in the crop, in the uh, formulation that are also toxic that were never studied. So they, they studied glyphosate in isolation when they got the approval. But then when you add it with these other ingredients, it becomes much more toxic, but they never studied it that way. And they studied the GMO crops also without spraying them with glyphosate. I was so shocked when they tried to see if the GMO was safe. They didn't spray it with glyphosate to test it. I mean, it's just insane that they separated those two out because it's the combination that makes it so toxic. Is, isn't it an example of the sleight of hand that, that industry can perform, which is doing so-called toxicity tests without even using the, the formulation, which that is, is going to so be That's so crazy, isn't used. it? It just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Yeah, and in fact, I saw a paper that compared the uh, the glyphosate-sensitive versus glyphosate-resistant crops. I think it was soy, um, and giving them glyphosate, and they found that the ones that were resistant really soaked up the glyphosate and ended up with it in their tissues, much more so than the ones that were sensitive. I mean, they ended up dying, Mm -hmm. and they couldn't really do that. So the, uh, the, uh, the, the Roundup Ready crops actually are better at soaking up the glyphosate and making it higher, making the levels higher in the food that you eat. So, so it's a great uh, opportunity to explain how this, the mechanism of toxicity, because I think it's relevant for when we talk later about um, the, the impact on human health. So how is, how is glyphosate um, impacting or killing um, these plants? Yeah, and I should show you my book, which I have right here. <laughs> this goes into great detail, Toxic Legacy, How the Weed Killer mm-hmm. Glyphosate is Destroying Our Health and the Environment, uh, published in June of 2021. And um, 
And in that book, I go into great detail about my theory that glyphosate is actually, uh, it's a glycine analog. That's known. It, it's, a, it's, an, it's an amino acid. Glyphosate's an amino acid. It's an analog of glycine. It's actually an entire glycine molecule, except that it's got some extra stuff stuck onto its nitrogen atom. That's what distinguishes it from glycine. But because it's an amino acid, acid analog, it has the potential to get into the proteins by mistake in place of glycine. There's many examples of amino acid analogs that are extremely toxic for other amino acids, not for glycine. This one is uniquely, I think, the only one I've been able to find that is an amino acid analog of glycine. Glycine is one of the coding amino acids. These are the building blocks of proteins. And glycine is the smallest amino acid. It has no side chains. Glyphosate doesn't have any side chains either because it's glycine. So it fits into the, into the socket. They've got this enzyme that says, okay, nobody can get in here besides glycine because it's really tiny. But glyphosate is glycine, so it can get in there. And extra stuff hanging on the nitrogen atom is outside because the nitrogen atom needs to hook up to the chain. It has to stay outside of that socket. So glyphosate fits into the enzyme that's going to use the code for glycine to put that glycine into the, into the protein that it's building. But it's going to stick glyphosate in there instead. And that is a really serious problem because for some proteins, that can totally mess up their ability to do their job. Yeah, and, and for the listener, I've talked about glycine before in the context of pregnancy, and glycine is one of the key building blocks of the molecule collagen. And when a, when a woman gets pregnant, their uterus grows, baby needs, needs uh, glycine and collagen at an amazing amount. Um, the uterus needs it to stretch, the placenta needs it. And uh, it's a very, very key, key uh, amino acid that we get from things like bone broth and, and meat, meat cooked on the bone. So what, what Stephanie's suggesting is that if our body is trying to make um, proteins using glycine, but is essentially picking up the wrong tool from the uh, workbench and using exactly. a glyphosate instead, then this is going to have um, massive implications for, for health. Can you, can you talk a little bit about the evidence behind um, that? Is it experimental evidence or how do we, how do we yeah. arrive or how did researchers arrive at this this uh, idea? And it, it isn't researchers, it's really just me. So you have to be aware of that. Uh, I, I have some friends who believe I'm right, but, uh, but as far as the agrochemical industry is concerned, they're denying that that's what's happening. However, their mm -hmm. own experiments practically proved it. And uh, Anthony Samsel collaborated with me on a number of papers and he was able to get the through a FOIA request, he was able to get a whole bunch of documents that were Monsanto's early studies back in the 1970s and 1980s. And, uh, and he rummaged through those and found a paper by researchers who were evaluating glyphosate. And they exposed bluegill sunfish, these are fish, uh, to radio labeled gly glyphosate so they could track where it went in their body. And then they got samples from their tissues and they looked for the radio label and they found it. So they knew then that it was accumulating in the tissues. That's one thing they say doesn't really happen, but they know it happens because they found it, for example, in this experiment. They could they could find that the radio label was there. And then they said, well, let's go, let's go measure for glyphosate using standard procedures to do that. And they came up short. Only 20% of the radio label in the tissue was glyphosate, up to 20%. So then the 80% went missing. So then they got the brilliant idea of adding enzymes that would break the, the, amino, the uh, proteins down into individual amino acids. So they did that, and the, and the yield went up to 80%. So in other words, they freed up the glyphosate that was tangled into the protein with these enzymes, and then they could see it as glyphosate. It, when it was embedded in the protein, they missed it. So the, 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 the technique that they were using could only see it in isolation. And then they said perhaps it was incorporated into the protein. That's their words in this paper that was from like the 1980s, where they said their conclusion was, maybe it was incorporated into the protein. So that's very dramatic. On top of that, EPSP synthase is the enzyme that it suppresses famously to, to sort of wreck the plants, kill the plants. By the way, our microbes also have EPSP synthase and they're also going to be affected by it. And that's a very serious enzyme that provides nutrients for the host. So it's very critical for the microbes in our gut. EPSP synthase has a sequence of amino acids at the place where it binds the phosphate of phosphoenolpyruvate. So it's very technical. And they know this, and they've done the studies, and they've shown that um, that enzyme has a glycine at that spot where it binds the phosphate. And if they replace that glycine with alanine, which is a minimal change, it has an extra methyl group. So it doesn't, it, it hurts the enzyme, but not too much. But it wrecks glyphosate's ability to suppress that enzyme. It completely destroys it. And so, which is weird, you know, because if it's suppressing it by substituting for the PEP, which is what they like to say, which is the substrate, 
that wouldn't be expected. It wouldn't be expected that glyphosate would be affected so much more than the actual substrate was affected. It doesn't make sense. The only thing that makes sense is that glyphosate needs to have that code for glycine. Once it's alanine, the code is wrong. It doesn't fit anymore. And then it can't substitute. So it's because the code is glycine, glyphosate gets into the enzyme, sticks its methylphosphonate unit in the spot where the phosphate of PEP is supposed to go. And now PEP can't fit and the en enzyme is dead in the water. It doesn't work. And that's what they see. It completely kills the enzyme's ability to, uh, to, to do the reaction. Do you see what I'm saying? So that's really, really critical that it's a, it absolutely essential glycine. In fact, they have these uh, GMO Roundup Ready crops they give them a bacterial version of that enzyme that doesn't have glycine at that spot. That's how they make it protected. The, 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 the engineering of the GMO crops is based on this principle that you can put alanine in there and it won't, and it won't, glyphosate won't touch it. Yeah, I, I mean, that's very interesting. And, and I, I really want to explain to the, the listener kind of these, these mechanisms of glyphosate toxicity because it, it really, I guess, what we're talking about hinges on rebutting the point from industry and, and, the, and governmental bodies that this is a safe chemical. And I mm -hmm. just want to quickly read out um, a, a, an edict by the Australian Pesticides and Veterinary Medicines Authority. And basically they're saying here that glyphosate is a herbicide that kills most plants. It works by blocking an enzyme called 5-enolpyrrolshikimate-3-phosphate, which is what Stephanie just mentioned. This enzyme is not found in humans or animals. When glyphosate is applied to plant, it spreads to all parts of the plant and glyphosate stops the plant cells um, from making some of the amino acids needed for plant growth. Humans and animals make these amino acids using a different process than plants. So uh, Stephanie, that this is- That different process is to use their bacteria We're using that same enzyme. That is so crazy that they said that. Where's the so science that, in what they said? Yeah, that, that's, that's from insane. their website. So, so I want you- I I I <laughs> let, Let's pause that out because that, there's some half truths in that, in that statement. So. T tell us what, why is this such a why is this an incorrect statement? Yeah, well, that's really really funny that they say that because uh, we depend upon our gut microbes to provide us with those essential amino acids that come out of that pathway, and our gut microbes use EPSP synthase to do that. Exactly the same enzyme that the plants use, and they are exactly the same affected by the glyphosate. So the so our microbes cannot make enough of these amino acids for the host. Those amino acids are extremely uh, useful. They're not only building blocks of proteins, but they're also precursors to incredibly important molecules in our body. Uh, thyroid hormone, the skin tanning agent melanin, melatonin, um, serotonin, uh, dopamine, uh, adrenaline. All of those come out of that shikimate pathway. And, and also B vitamins, certain B vitamins. So we're like really, really messed up if we don't get enough of those aromatic amino acids. And the, and glyphosate is going to cause our microbes to not be able to produce enough for the host. My, it's mind blowing. And you know, I made that mental note to myself when I was reading literature about the pathway on EPS synthase. And I noticed, okay, tryptophan is in there. What's the precursor to to mel mel melatonin? Is tryptophan. So yeah, exactly, um, you can see you can see how perhaps our circadian biology, our ability to maintain yeah. Um, our circadian biology is going to be impacted if we're consuming foods contaminated with glyphosate. Yes, and in fact, uh, Nancy and I did a plot on sleep disorder. We got the data for sleep disorder from the web on U.S. Uh, government data and correlates a rise in sleep disorder in our in America is epidemic right now. Uh, huge numbers of people are suffering from sleep disorders exactly in step. The rise was matches perfectly with the rise in glyphosate usage on corn and soy crops. So and, I think we're we'll being talk affected because of that. Yeah, and we'll, we'll talk about autism a bit later, but um, you know, in my clinical practice, I see children with severe autism and circadian disruption and poor sleep is, is hand in hand. And, and again, it's very yes. difficult to tease out the, the exact causality here, but it's, um, it's, it's a striking uh, association. The, um, the, I've also heard you talk about the impact of um, glyphosate, because as we've just laid out, it's essentially working as an antibiotic for your mm -hmm. gut microbes. And if you're nuking a certain species of beneficial gut microbes, you can get an overgrowth of, of, exactly. of undesirable microbes. So talk to us about Clostridium and, and what can happen if we're right. potentially ingesting this glyphosate. Right, because the, the uh, key bi uh, microbes that are really important in the infant gut are bifidobacteria and lactobacillus. And studies have shown that both of those are extremely sensitive to glyphosate, much more sensitive than a lot of the other species. And Clostridia has a lot more resistance. And so what happens is those guys get killed off and then the clostridia has an opportunity to grow because of this uh, void that's left by their uh, by the reduction in those 
other microbes. A baby is supposed to have almost all lactobacillus. I believe it's lactobacillus that's dominant in the infant uh, when the baby's nursing. Lactobacillus helps you to digest the milk, but they don't anymore. They used to, but they don't anymore have a dominant lactobacillus profile. They have all these other microbes that are competing. And the clostridia produce uh, metabolites that are called toxic phenolic compounds like peak in the urine and in the blood has been linked to autism. So what's happening is that these toxic metabolites of the um, of the clostridia species end up actually getting into the brain and disrupting the brain's function. Wow. I mean, who, 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 in talk, talking about unintended consequences and the, the, the beginning was, okay, we'll, we'll develop a compound that might help us uh, make, make food mm -hmm. or kill weeds more easily. And then the sixth or the third, fourth, fifth order effect is that, you know, we're causing people to disrupt their sleep and, and give the potentially giving contributing or to autism. It's um it, it's fascinating. Can you talk a little bit more about the residue problem and if we're getting glycine um, substitution? So again, it's think about uh, your 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 body is a machine. It's taking tools to kind of build the structure of its body, and it's taking the wrong tool. If it's got glyphosate present, it's taking the wrong tool instead of the glycine. So what what are you, the implications of this in terms of what you're researching? They're vast, and it's uh, my book talks about various enzymes. So, you know, I have I, I do a, connect the dots. So I, I look at papers that say glyphosate suppresses this enzyme, and then I look at the enzyme and I see if it has what I call a glyphosate susceptibility motif, which I define very specifically as having highly conserved glycine residue at a place where it binds phosphate, and that if that glycine is substituted by something else, the protein's dead in the water, and that's what I'm seeing. There's a number of different proteins. And I speak about individual proteins in my book. PEPCK is one. Myosin, which is the contractile protein, that's important in the gut. In fact, there was a um, paper about a, a case study of a woman who was trying to kill herself and she drank uh, Roundup or, or some kind of glyphosate formulation. And then they observed the effect of it, you know, and what, what they noticed was that it paralyzed her gut. One of the things it did was it paralyzed her gut. And I think that's because it got into... Myosin. Myosin has nine or 11, I forget, a lot of highly conserved glycines. And there was one paper in particular I was really impressed with because they showed specifically one of those glycines, if you substitute alanine, again, minimal change, extra methyl, it can only contract at 2% capacity. So if you throw glyphosate into that protein, you're going to mess up its ability to contract. You're going to have constipation in the gut. And constipation is linked to, to autism, it's, and that's actually another one of those diseases or conditions that's going up dramatically exactly in step. With the rise in glyphosate usage, and I think it's because glyphosate is messing up myosin, and now the, the gut can't contract. It's paralyzed, partially mm -hmm. paralyzed. And, and in terms of human studies, how would we be able to gain more evidence that this is actually occurring in vivo? Yeah, well, there's a lot of data, uh, you know, there's data on rats, of course, where they've, they, they expose the rats to glyphosate and they see what happens. And, they've, and so lots of papers are coming out recently. And there are now studies showing up where they're looking at uh, measuring glyphosate in the urine of mm. a population of people and then looking at other correlations with that. And there's a paper that shows that there was a paper on, uh, on uh, liver disease, fatty, uh, fatty liver disease, uh, non-alcoholic uh, steatohepatitis, I think it's called fatty liver disease. Um, and they saw that in humans, and they measured the glyphosate in the urine, and they had they had three groups. The people who didn't have the liver disease, the people who had milder cases, and the people who had more severe cases. And they found consistent, statistically significant correlations between the amount of glyphosate in the urine and those three categories. Among all three, they, they found statistically significant differences. I was actually really surprised that you could see that through just looking at a, a urinary sample of the glyphosate, because a urinary sample is just measuring your exposure, mostly for the last couple of weeks, very specific in time. And so I was, I was amazed that they could actually see that um, correlation, uh, despite that kind of rough measurement, you know. And there are studies that have done on, like, at the state level, looking at all the states of the United States, looking at glyphosate usage on crops in that state, and looking at testicular cancer. And they found an incredibly strong correlation between and so this is a, instead of time, it, it's, it's, it's space, right? You've got individual states using different amounts of glyphosate. And the ones that use the most glyphosate had much higher risk of testicular cancer. I'm quite sure that it causes testicular cancer. Mm. And, uh, it's, so, uh, and then there's also, there was one on, uh, on pregnant women. There's been some on pregnant women, but one in particular that I recall was quite interesting because this is a recent study 
Now they looked at glyphosate in the urine in the pregnant women when they were late in pregnancy. And then they had a measure uh, called the anogenital distance in p- female babies. That's an indicator of excess testosterone. They knew this from before that this is an indicator. Of, if it's big, then it's an indicator of too much testosterone exposure in utero. And it's also a predictor for uh, PCOS, polycystic ovary syndrome, much higher risk of having that if you have this metric as, as an infant, if it's high. And they found the correlation between the mother's urine, uh, urinary glyphosate, and the length of that distance, um, which would then predict uh, increased risk of polycystic ovary syndrome. Polycystic ovary syndrome, syndrome is associated with increased risk to autism in the offspring, as well as in the woman who has the polycystic ovary syndrome. It's connected to glyphosate. I mean, it's, it's connected to um, autism both ways. Uh, see where I'm losing my train of thought here. <laughs> and, then, um, and, and it's one of the, it is the most common uh, problem associated with infertility in women. So it's a pretty, it's, it's a, an excess testosterone in utero. And the reason is very clear because glyphosate disrupts the enzyme aromatase, which converts testosterone to estrogen. And they talk about autism being sort of super male. And I think that's kind of a, a way to characterize it having to do with too much testosterone exposure in utero. Not enough estrogen. Estrogen actually protects the brain from oxidative damage. And when you don't have enough estrogen, your brain's going to be more susceptible to damage. Yes. And I talked to Dr. Anthony Jay, and he's a very well known um, researcher on endocrine disrupting compounds and, and their effect on, on humans. And he mentioned glyphosate and he mentioned that. He initially didn't see it as an endocrine disruptor, but um, until he realized it was, I believe, chelating in, in a, a, a metal ion and was basically yes. complex in double. And that was how it was having an endocrine disrupting uh, effect. It, it does it in multiple ways because one of them is disrupting aromatase. That's really serious because that's going to definitely disrupt the sex hormones. And then chelating metal minerals is going to prevent those, um, make those minerals deficient. And it mm. definitely messes up the minerals in a big way. Actually, it makes them simultaneously deficient and toxic because it disrupts the body's natural mechanism for transporting them and delivering to them to where they'll be useful. Minerals are tricky because they can be toxic. Iron, for example, can be both toxic and deficient at the same time, particularly if you're being exposed to glyphosate because it kind of prevents the body from transporting the iron safely and getting it to where it needs to be to, to be able to do the chemical reaction because it catalyzes Lots of enzymes. Iron is a very important catalyst, and, and most of these metals are. Manganese. I, we did a whole paper on manganese. Um, glyphosate really messes up the body's ability to transport and deliver manganese, and that's also connected to autism. So, um, yeah, it's a lot of dots to connect, and I talk about a lot of them in my book. But it's really fascinating. Um, I love puzzles, and this is a really great puzzle yeah, to work out. How, yeah. And um, so we talked about. In terms of these mechanisms of toxicity, we've talked about gut microbiota disruption and the shikimate pathway. We've talked about glycine residue substitution. Um, we've talked about endocrine disruption. Um, the fourth one that uh, you, I know you've been talking a lot about and researching recently is deuterium. Now, Thank you. The, <laughs> the, the, the listeners to this podcast have heard me talk about deuterium. I bring them on. I get them to explain the concept. Because deuterium is not anything that people are encountering conceptually on, on, a, on a very daily, a daily basis at all. So maybe if you could start with what is deuterium yeah. before we um, go further. Right. And it's interesting that everyone kind of hesitates. I try to get people in podcasts to talk about deuterium and a lot of them say, no, 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 it's too hard. People don't understand it. They're bored. You know, I find it absolutely extraordinarily fascinating. And so I'm really into deuterium lately. Because uh, I realized right away, as soon as I heard about deuterium, the glyphosate would mess it up. I, it, it was in 2019, December of 2019, that I got an email from Laszlo Boros. Uh, he's, he's a professor. He was trained at the Zent Georgi Institute in Hungary. So he's got that East European background that has a lot more interest in sort of biophysics and these other aspects that we don't really pay much attention to in this country. And we really should be. And I know you mentioned Jack Cruz, and he's been really great at promoting some of these things. But there's a lot that goes on in biology that we don't understand. And we need to understand it because it's, it actually explains everything. I'm so amazed at how deuterium can explain the bizarre behavior of cancer cells. It can explain um, all the neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, it can explain um, autism. I mean, it's just incredible how, uh, how important deuterium is to the body and how the body has become very skilled at putting deuterium where it wants it to be, and keeping it away from where it doesn't want it to be. But the enzymes that do that are wrecked by glyphosate, and that is a huge problem. I think deuterium toxicity 
uh, is the uh, primary uh, is the is the most important factor that glyphosate uh, causes to cause disease. And then I think it di- disrupted deuterium is associated with many, many different diseases, chronic diseases that we're facing today. So very, very important. And let me tell you what deuterium is, because it's actually pretty simple. It's heavy hydrogen. So hydrogen is the smallest atom. It's the upper left-hand corner of the periodic table. If, for you chemist buffs, right? You have the periodic table that shows all the atoms. And hydrogen is tiny. It's got one proton and one electron, and that's all. And of course, hydrogen is by far the most common atom in our body, by far, uh, because it's so tiny and because it hooks up to everything. And it's, of course, H2O is water. So we have a lot of water in our body. That's two hydrogens and one oxygen. So we have tons and tons of hydrogen in our body. And hydrogen is involved in just about every reaction. I don't even know of a reaction that doesn't involve hydrogen. So it's critically involved in all the chemical reactions, the biochemical reactions that are that are catalyzed by all the enzymes in our body, critically involved. And... Um, so deuterium is hydrogen plus a neutron. So it's got a proton, an electron, and a neutron. It's kind of like carbon-14. Carbon-12, carbon-14, you've probably heard of that. It's a different isotope of hydrogen. And it's not very common. It's 50, 155 parts per million. So for every million hydrogen atoms, there are 155 deuterium atoms. And that sounds small, but the fact is it's five times as high a concentration in the blood as calcium. So it's, it's more common in the blood than any of the minerals. So it, so it's there, it's around, it's going to have an effect because it's twice as heavy as hydrogen, therefore it behaves very differently in chemical reactions. And so it, it, it binds more tightly, covalently to the molecule it is connected to, and it binds more weakly to the other guys in these sort of ionic bonds that happen with other molecules. So it behaves differently. And in certain proteins, certain enzymes, it behaves differently in such a way that they're extremely unhappy about having it there. And in particular, ATPase. ATPase is the enzyme in the mitochondria that makes ATP. Very, very important enzyme in mitochondria because ATP is the energy source of the cell. So those enzymes, there's lots and lots, there's thousands, millions probably of these ATPase enzymes in each mitochondrion. They have lots and lots of these enzymes. And they they depend upon proton motive force. The protons are being pushed through the enzyme. And and, um, and the protons... uh, give the energy that allows them to make the ATP. And the problem is that deuterons are too big and clumsy and they stick. They have all, it's kind of like putting sugar in the gas tank. The deuterons hurt the enzyme and they can break it. And what the effect of that is that the enzyme can't make ATP as efficiently and it releases reactive oxygen species. And reactive oxygen species are really bad because they can cause cancer. They cause genetic mutations in the mitochondrial DNA. They mess up the mitochondrial lipids, the, pro- the membrane of the mitochondrion. And of course, then you also don't have the ATP that you can make. So you get, you get energy loss and, and then you're getting, the mitochondria are getting wrecked. So first the ATPase pumps get wrecked and the mitochondrion gets wrecked. Then you have, you know, mitochondrial dysfunction, which is linked to all kinds of diseases, certainly with autism, with Alzheimer's, you know, huge list of autoimmune diseases. They're all connected to mitochondrial dysfunction. Yeah, and and it's Dr. Doug Wallace who who wrote the paper the the mitochondrial bioenergetic etiology of disease, which I keep referring to, but essentially mm. ma- maps out the blueprint of how modern diseases, Neolithic diseases, everything that we're seeing, and um, you know, basically the nursing home diseases uh, are are related to mitochondrial dysfunction, and it makes exactly. sense when when you can see how fundamental that. The energy production of the cell, and when when this energy production or energy ability of the cell to to maintain its uh, energy state decreases, then the whole kind of show falls apart. And um, I've had other guests describe that mechanism, and I, and I like your analogy of the sugar in the gas tank. Someone has also described it as if you had a um, maybe a little bit uh, less sensitive, but if you had a, a fat kid in a um, in a water slide. And he gets stuck in. <laughs> in, in that's, a good, that's a good analogy for the deuterium. It's a fat kid. <laughs> yeah, he's the fat kid, and he can't. And he's, he's going to block up the the path, so he can't. So the, exactly. the ATPase can't spin properly. So that's exactly that's one way right. of thinking that's about beautiful. it. Beautiful, I like that. <laughs> so how did we work that out? How did how were they able to um, understand that deuterium was having this effect at such a basically sub cellular level? I know. I mean, this is the fancy research that's been done by people in Eastern Europe. It's mostly Russia, uh, mm. Hungary, and Ukraine. Those are the three countries where this research is uh, is more active. The, most of the people in the U.S. don't even 
know that deuterium has any role in biology. I mean, we're so clueless, including the researchers. I mean, they just never talk about deuterium, most of them. There's a very slow trickle right now, and I've been trying to shout to the rooftops because I want people to realize deuterium is what you need to study to understand what is going on today and why things are so messed up. It absolutely is. And and I, I every time I... I'm I'm very excited right now. I've, I've got Laszlo. Laszlo and I are very much engaged with email exchanges along with another guy. So Laszlo, I guess he's in, I think he's in Hungary now. And um, and then there's a guy in Greece, um, Anthony Kyriakopoulos and me. And the three of us have been exchanging emails like crazy, finding papers and sharing. And we're like in an explosion of discovery. It's so exciting right now because we're finding ways to explain neurodegenerative disease uh, and to explain tau protein, I mean, really very specific things that we're realizing why now they play a role in trying to uh, recover from the deuterium toxicity. So there's, it's cancer is a, um, cancer cells are exposed to too much deuterium, so the mitochondria aren't working properly. And they and they do a very bizarre metabolism where they, they, they eat lots of sugar. You know, you've probably heard about this, the um, uh, Warburg effect. The Warburg, yeah, metabolism. Warburg. Yeah. Or Warburg metabolism, where they, they, they consume lots of sugar, they turn glucose into lactate, and they ship it out. And lactate becomes actually a good source of energy for the rest of the body as a deuterium-depleted nutrient, because the way they make the lactate, they put a really nice hydrogen on there that is a good source of low deuterium hydrogen. And then, I meanwhile, they, they don't use their mitochondria the same way as other cells do. They actually are doing a lot of... It's more producing... Uh, supplies rather than burning energy in the mitochondria. And they produce those supplies that are needed to make all the DNA. They need to copy themselves, right? Because they're busy copying. They're obsessed on copying themselves. They have to make all that DNA. They have to make new cell membranes. They have to make a lot of lipids and DNA. And they make those from the resources that are in the mitochondria, taking them out and then shutting down the mitochondrial energy production to get the ATP from the glycolysis, you know? So they completely change the way they're doing stuff. Um, really fascinating things that they do with proline. And proline is a very interesting amino acid that we're really um, learning about. We're reading all kinds of interesting articles about proline lately. Um, absolutely fascinating because proline, as you may know, is that you said glycine in, in uh, collagen, lots of glycine in collagen, which is certainly true, but also lots of proline. It has huge amounts of proline, huge amounts of glycine. And proline is uniquely the only amino acid that's able to trap deuterium. And this is something I've only been learning recently, but I'm really fascinated. Proline can trap deuterium. And so all the structural proteins, that we have all these different structural proteins in our body that aren't enzymes. They're just things that hold our body together. And those proteins tend to have lots of proline. And of course, collagen has tons of proline. So what is happening, I think, is that the body, proline has this fascinating ability to, once it gets a, a deuterium atom in the molecule, it keeps it. It won't let go. So it traps deuterium, and it can sort of soak up all the deuterium in the environment, reducing the amount of deuterium that's in the in the fluid water, for example, in the blood, right, by trapping it in the collagen. It's really interesting. And then I think by trapping deuterium, it also makes the gelled water more gelled, more gelled oh. water and better gelled water because of the deuterium. And, and you know, Lazo yeah, and, and that's... yeah, go ahead. Sorry, go on. <laughs> um, the um, I was thinking of um, uh, shoot, I lost his name now. Uh, Jerry Pollock, you know about Jerry Pollock? Yes, yeah, I've, I've heard of him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's written a book, uh, Cells, Gels, and the Engines of Life, and also the book, um, The Fourth Phase of Water, where he talks about the gelled water. Really fascinating books about biology and about gelled water, and about how the gelled water creates a battery that pushes protons out. And so it becomes negatively charged. The gel becomes negatively charged. It pushes the protons out. And the thing is, it pushes protons, not deuterons, out. It traps the deuterons in the gel, and it pushes the protons out. So that results in the fluid blood having less deuterium because it's being enriched in protons that are not deuterons. So it allows the fluid blood to have less deuterium because the deuterium is being trapped in the gel that's formed around the collagen, and the collagen is grabbing the deuterium and trapping it in the in the proline. So there's a process of trapping deuterium in the gel in order to make the fluid water have less deuterium. And then there's also another process, all these enzymes that have a skilled strategy when they do the reaction. If the substrate has a deuterium at the spot where they want to take the hydrogen off, they won't do it. So they, they only take it if it's hydrogen. So these um, enzymes produce products that are low in deuterium. And there's actually an enzyme that can do that with proline. So it takes the proline's 
uh, that have hydrogen there and that and it uses them to make a, a ATP. The cancer cells do this. They like to use proline to make the ATP. And then what's left behind is proline that's enriched in deuterium because those are the ones that don't react. And then they put those back in the matrix. So by going around and around with their matrix, the cancer cells produce extremely high, I suspect, and this hasn't been proven, but extremely high levels of deuterium in their extracellular matrix, trapping it there in order to help with the deuterium toxicity problem. You see what I'm wow. saying? Yeah, it's it's, it's, fancy very, stuff. it's very fancy. And I guess the clinical implication of, of what you're talking about and Dr. Laszlo is doing is is cancer treatment and lifestyle approaches to cancer treatment using um, deuterium depleted water. Exactly. Uh, I, I wanted to pick on, pick up on a couple of points that you made, and I just in my head had an analogy. Hang on, I have a, I have some noise. Can I just? Uh, yeah, sure. Shut my door. Hang on. No worries. Sorry about that. No problem. I I, I yeah. just had an, an an analogy pop into my head because Dr. Jack Cruz makes the point that we have evolved this. The, the TCA cycle, the process of glycolysis has involved these enzymatic reactions that basically select for um, uh, for getting rid of deuterium, for, for getting exactly, hydrogen and yes. getting rid of deuterium. And and it's imagine, I just ha have in my mind, imagine a, a basically like a lumber mill and you're getting raw um, pieces of massive tree logs come, kind of being brought into your factory and, and that's the cell. And inside that factory, you've got like a furnace where you're, you're burning them for energy. And you, your body has developed a checks and balances quality control program to basically uh, select the lumber logs that have the least amount of kind of branches sticking out. And it's only taking in the most, the smoothest ones to then burn inside the furnace to make energy for the cell. I mean, does that sound... Um, that's a nice analogy. I like your analogies. <laughs> I like the fact that you have a slide. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that's good. Because there's a selection process that chooses the good guys. And mm. the good guys are the ones that have hydrogen, not deuterium. And, yeah, and if you've got, and if you've got too many, yeah, you've got too much deuterium. It's like you've, you're, you're only feeding these um, lumber, really low quality lumber into your, into your factory. Exactly. So that you're going to have problems crop up. The, the other thought that I had was, you're mentioning collagen, and collagen contains glycine, it contains proline, it contains valine. These are all amino acids. We've talked about glyphosate substituting for um, for uh, glycine, and we've also talked about proline as harvesting or kind of entrapping deuterium. We, mm -hmm. I, I talked to Tristan, um, who you, I think you're talking to recently, but the work of Robert O'Becker revealed that collagen is acting as a semiconductor, like a biological mm. semiconductor in the body. So I'm just thinking that if we've got a diet that's high in deuterium, we've got a diet that's high in glyphosate, and we're basically messing up the production of collagen, then its effect it's as a, a semicond biological semiconductor in the body is going to be in, presumably impaired. Yes. Yes, I agree. In fact, you know, collagen has that beautiful crystal uh, tri triple helix structure that it, that it depends upon glycine every 30 amino acids, GXY, 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 every 30 amino acids is glycine for large, large sequences in, in collagen. And that is critical to make it form this triple helix. When you start putting glyphosate at random spots, it's not gonna be able to make that triple helix anymore. And it's gonna be very bad in terms of its properties that we depend on for it to work the way it works. And collagen is so important. A third of our proteins in our body are collagen molecules. We have a huge number of collagen molecules. And they're so important for the structural um, integrity of our body. And we have all these problems with back pain and knee surgery and hip replacement surgery. You know, all this stuff that's happening these days. People have really bad bones, and I think it and joints. You know, and I think it's uh, glyphosate's a major player in that. Yeah, I, I imagine one, it would be a diet diet deficient in glycine itself. No one's eating meat on the bone or bone broth anymore. I know and, people are avoiding it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and two would be the probably the presence of, of glyphosate, as you said. And I, I want you to keep talking about deuterium because um, yes. we, we, you painted this picture of this is the heavy hydrogen is basically incompatible with um, biology in many ways. Yes, there's uh, yeah. we've adapted certain kind of compartmentalized uh, uses or presence of, of deuterium in biological systems. But what, what, what you've described is that the mitochondria are going to work most optimally with in a, in a setting where there's not deuterium within in, inside the matrix. So what, what happened ancestrally in terms of our deuterium load, how we were ingesting deuterium, and how has that changed today? 
Hmm. <laughs> uh, well, I, I think it has a lot to do with glyphosate, and I really want to actually go into the gut microbes. You'll find this really interesting because the gut microbes, you probably know that the gut, gut microbes make gases. They make hmm. methane. You know, people are complaining about the methane from the cows causing climate change, right? They make methane, They make, but they make hydrogen gas first. They make hydrogen gas. They turn that into methane. Uh, they can make hydrogen sulfide gas, all these gases, right? And you can get bloating if the, you have too much gas in your gut, you get bloating. And a lot of people have problems with gas you know, these days. And uh, the reason I think why they have problems with gas is because the enzymes in the microbes that take that gas back in and make organic molecules out of it are broken by glyphosate. And this, I think, is a huge issue. And so this is where I've gotten into the idea of glyphosate suppressing dehydrogenases. That's a particular class of enzymes, dehydrogenases. And those enzymes actually take hydrogen out of uh, the source molecule, which is an organic molecule of some sort. They take the hydrogen out, and then they put that hydrogen somewhere where they can keep it safe and deliver it eventually to the mitochondria. So they're, they're actually pulling the hydrogens out of these molecules um, to, make, um, to preserve the hydrogen to deliver it to the mitochondria. And they are selecting molecules that are low in deuterium to begin with, and the reason why is because they come from that hydrogen gas. So it's really, really interesting. The micro microbes make, uh, they pull hydrogen off of organic molecules to make hydrogen gas, H2. And that gas is going to be 80% de depleted in deuterium because of the enzyme that does it in the microbes. They have these really fancy enzymes, but partly just because uh, deuterium likes to stay in the liquid form. Deuterium stays in the ice when the ice melts. So you have low deuterium water coming off the ice. The glacier water is healthy for that reason because it has less deuterium. And then deuterium stays in the gelled water, and that's why when it pushes out the protons, those are low deuterium protons. But as well, when you turn and when you pull hydrogen out as a gas, the deuterium doesn't want to leave the liquid phase. So you end up selecting for hydrogens over deuterium. So when you make that hydrogen gas, it's got 80% reduced uh, levels of deuterium in that hydrogen gas. Then it takes the methane. It takes carbon dioxide and hydrogen gas and makes methane. The, the gut microbes do this as well. And then that methane gets converted into methanol, to formaldehyde, formate, all these things. Um, and then in particular, when the methanol gets made, it can be attached to uh, methionine to make, um, to make the methionine with the methyl there. The methyl that's attached to the sulfur on methionine is a universal methyl donor. That methyl is very important. So methionine is, a, is an amino acid. It's a sulfur-containing amino acid. It contains that methyl. That's why it says methionine, that's for the methyl. And that methyl is passed around all over the body. It methylates the DNA, it methylates proteins, it methylates the um, sugar, sugar chains. I mean, it's just throwing those methyls every which where. In fact, melatonin has a methyl derived from um, going, tracing back to that hydrogen gas. So basically, the body keeps track of those methyls that came from methane, that came from hydrogen gas, because those methyls are going to be really low in deuterium. And then it wants to funnel them into the mitochondria. So it's really fascinating that the whole methylation pathway system is a, is a technique the body uses to hang on to those beautiful methyls that came from methane, that came from hydrogen gas. Do you see what I'm saying? It's really fascinating. So, the, so you need so the gases in the Go on. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Look, so you're, you're saying that the implication is that if we're, if we're ingesting a diet that's contaminated with glyphosate, then our, our body's ability to, or our gut microbes' ability to um, produce gases in, in, in their correct proportion is going to be impaired? Is that how I'm understanding yeah, right? Yeah, the problem is to ca capture that methane and turn it back into organic matter. Uh, and then, of course, the methane builds up and you get cows produce a lot of methane and then you have climate change problems because methane is a really bad greenhouse gas. If the cows were eating organic food, we would ha they would release a lot less methane. And they would be a lot healthier for the environment. Wow. I mean, the... the Topics that we that talk about in Australia are about feeding cows seaweed as kind of ways to mitigate um, their methane emission. And to me, that doesn't seem very ancestrally appropriate. <laughs> it doesn't how, seem like cows how, how often, can, Yeah, can, would cows have access to methane? It seems a little bit ridiculous in my mind. And But it also makes sense what you said, which is if, we're, if cows are grazing on glyphosate-laden pastures, then um, it's going to screw up biological systems in ways that we're just discovering. And, and that definitely could be one. Um, I, I want to share a little anecdote with you, um, Stephanie, because I think it's relevant to the point you just made. And around um, uh, maybe six years ago, I did a, a vegan kind of plant-based uh, phase, and I was eating a lot of pulses, legumes, um, vegetables, um, and I had the worst 
I'm happy to admit now, the worst digestion, gas, bloating, you know, all, all this <laughs> thing. And, and it went away when I basically went carnivore. Um, and oh, I su- suspect that, and especially what you're talking about, it makes sense that um, uh, glyphosate could be one of the main reasons why I had that such bad digestion that people who are eating um, a very, very diet rich in plant foods that is probably contaminated with glyphosate residue have such poor digestion. Yes, I think that's probably true. And of course, animal-based foods have uh, much more cysteine and methionine, the sulfur-containing amino acids. Taurine is only in, in animal-based. Well, the only uh, plant-based food that has taurine is seaweed. No, nothing else but seaweed has taurine among the plants. Whereas the animal-based foods have a lot of taurine, and taurine is a is a super molecule. Uh, I've done a lot of studying on taurine. It's um, it's it's the only sulfonated amino acid, so it has a sulfonate, which is almost sulfate, and the gut microbes can harvest it can harvest sulfate from taurine. The gut microbes can do that. Our cells can't. We we our cells are pretty defective, actually. It's interesting how much we depend on our microbes, but the taurine becomes a source of sulfate, and sulfate is absolutely critical in the extracellular matrix for maintaining the gel. And so sulfate deficiency becomes a, uh, an inability to trap deuterium in the gel, which then becomes excess deuterium in the water, and you have the whole problem. So um, I, I have studied, uh, my book talks a lot about sulfation pathways. Autistic kids have defective sulfation pathways and defective methylation pathways. That's very clear from the literature. Both of them are caused by glyphosate. It's a, it's a good opportunity to talk about autism and and because I, I think when we're observing population level changes in dramatic ways, which is incidences of certain diseases, we it, it, it's difficult to necessarily pin it pin these things down to one one causative kind of factor. But I guess your research is probabilistically suggesting that glyphosate contamination is largely responsible. So, can you tell us about? your work with autism and, and why you think the clues point towards uh, glyphosate? Oh, wow. It's just so many different ways. It's actually quite interesting when I look back at my own personal history and in, in my journey of trying to figure these things out because I got interested in biology. I've been interested in biology all my life. I have an undergraduate degree in biology from MIT. Um, but I got especially interested when I started seeing the autism rates going up in the first part of the century. 2000, 2001, 2002, up to 2007. Every every year, oh, there's more autism. We're just diagnosing it more. I didn't believe it. I thought it's got to be something in the environment that's causing this problem. In the United States, we have one in 36 boy, uh, kids in our country have autism. Now, it's absolutely shocking. And it's going to get up to something even higher because we're not doing anything to address it. And I find this terrifying. I think that the future is grim if our kids are that sick. And the burden of all these adult autistic people that are now aging out of childhood that we're facing now as adults, because we had very little autism in the adults until these kids grew up, you know. And so now we've got all these uh, adult autistic people and we don't even have the system in place to take care of them, you know. So it's going to be really grim, I think. And we just have to turn this around. And I believe if we just uh, got rid of, if we stopped using herbicides, I have to say herbicides in general, not just glyphosate, because I think all the herbicides are very toxic. And if you just substitute something else for glyphosate, you're going to have a whole other set of diseases that are going to start showing up. So the only solution, I think, is to go organic, to grow organic food and stop putting chemicals on our food. I think that's what we absolutely have to do if we want to have healthy children in the future. So, um, so that tirade. So anyway, I, so I, 2007, I said, I got to figure out what it is. There's something in the environment that's causing this. I got to figure out. And, um, I didn't, uh, I couldn't find anything. I, I, uh, after five years, I knew a lot about autism and all the different complex features that they have. They have a lot of just, you know, disruption of a lot of different things, the gut problems, um, of course the brain problems and, uh, and then, uh, impaired methylation pathways, impaired sulfation pathways. I saw all of that. Um, but I couldn't figure out what was causing it. And it just happened to be by luck that I heard a uh, presentation, a two-hour presentation by Professor Don Huber, who's an expert on plant pathology, expert on glyphosate. He's been, again, shouting to the rooftops, trying to tell people this stuff is toxic for many years. And I heard his talk in 2012, and I was just blown away. I was like, this is it. you know. And I just dropped everything and started studying glyphosate from that point on. And, and then I found out that glyphosate causes the methylation problems. It causes the sulfation problems. So it causes all the things that you're seeing in the autistic kids. It's a perfect match. 
and the sleep disorder, you know, all of that can be explained by glyphosate. And I talked to Robert Zimmerman, a optics engineer recently, and, and we, he was talking about the fact that um, our modern environments are very deplete of near infrared light because everyone's inside all day. Mm. And some key proteins that get synthesized antenatally are um, in, 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 on um, exposure to near infrared. So the fact that everyone's inside, blue lit screens, light in near infrared deficient could also possibly be another contributor. So, I mean, it's, there's never going to be only one thing in, on a societal level, maybe in different individuals, it's, it's more one factor, but it's definitely a problem. And I think you, you've made a pretty, pretty interesting case that um, glyphosate is, is playing a, a strong role. I, I, I want to talk about the contamination le level because um, I found a study here in Australia. This is the 25th Australian total diet study. And they assess the glyphosate in the food supply as part of this study. And what they've, what they've said here is that, um, and this is part of that, the same Australian um, Pesticides and Veterinary Medicines Authority. They said that um, we found very low levels of glyphosate in some cereal-based foods, including bread, biscuits, breakfast, and infant cereal. So that makes sense if we've just talked about crop desiccation of wheat using glyphosate. So it makes sense that wheat-based products might have glyphosate in it. So what they've, what they've said next is all detections were well below maximum residue mm. limits allowed under the code. These levels are set to protect the safety of consumers and reflect good agricultural practice. So to me, that sounds like um, we're trying to balance the needs of the industrial agricultural complex without, um, without, without damaging your health too much. They said the highest detection was 0 0.08 milligrams per kilogram and um, estimated uh, Dietary exposure to glyphosate for Australian consumers was less than 1% of internationally accepted levels, and there are no concerns for the Australian population. So um, what, what do you, what's your take on that, and what do you think is safe exposure level, if any? Yeah, I don't think any level is safe. I mean, glyphosate is an endocrine disruptor, and endocrine disruptors are known to be more toxic at low, low levels than at higher levels. That's one thing that the industry, when they, uh, when they were evaluating glyphosate back in the 1970s, uh, they set up a rule that said if you couldn't find toxicity at a certain mm -hmm. level, uh, you didn't have to look any lower than that. Like the, the, the dose makes the poison. So if it's not toxic at this level, then I don't need to look at anything lower than that. But when it gets to the lower level, it starts to behave like an endocrine disruptor. So that's really tricky that those very low levels can cause toxicity. And my guess is that they saw that the very low levels were causing toxicity and that's why they made that rule. They also made a rule look for three months, animal studies. If you don't see any toxicity after three months, you're good to go. And then when Seralini did his study where he exposed the rats to glyphosate for their entire lifespan, after three months, they were looking fine. They couldn't really tell the dif difference between the treated group and the, and the controls. It was at four months that they started to see problems. Yeah, so, I mean, um, that, that, that goes into- these rules to avoid finding the thing they don't want to find, <laughs> right? You know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and and that's the point that you raise about the, the endocrine disruption harm detection is those so-called non-monotonic dosing um, effects, which is and um, it's it's not linear. You can have a tiny dose, you can have a larger dose, and, and perhaps there's even a U shape in terms of um, mm -hmm. endocrine disrupting right, effect. Right. Exactly. So uh, again, that's a that's a nuance here that um, even the tiniest minuscule dose could be having a, a toxic effect, and and there's no real way to map that limit that they've. Um, that they've said here, so whatever that that parts per million that they've stated is safe. There's no way to really, in my mind, um, kind of quantify the effect on individuals' gut microbiota. Like, how can you say that someone's gut microbiota is not affected at, at that arbitrary limit? It doesn't make sense to me. The other thing about the limit is that it's very arbitrary. In fact, I've been following because it used to be they had a certain limit for glyphosate, and then the industry would discover that it was showing up at, above the limit in certain foods. So the industry would say to the regulators, oh, you need to change that limit because we're seeing foods higher than that. That's up, that's up it by even a factor of 30 or something. They made changes in the, uh, in the limit over time to make it higher and higher. And, the, and it looks like the industry just says, oh, okay, good. Yeah, okay, you want to make that bigger? Okay, fine, let's just make that bigger. They don't even really evaluate whether that's safe or not. They just say, oh, fine, we'll just change that number. You know. So yeah. U.S. has very high limits compared to Europe on many of these individual foods. What's the highest level that's allowed? And they just raise it when the industry pressures them to say, oh, dear, we're finding foods that have, are above the limit. 
they don't want to be at fault. So they tell the regulators to change the limit and the regulators go ahead and do that. It's just amazing. They're not like studying anything to decide that it's safe. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I take a very simplistic maybe um, view of this, which is, did it exist in our ancestral past? The answer is a resounding no. So um, none is, is, it, none should, back then. <laughs> it should be the it's answer. A, it's a very scary molecule. It is so scary to me um, what it can do. Um, you know, oh, glycine substitution. I'll just read out one more passage from this report. And, and it says here, this is from a dietary perspective. And um, so at the highest concentration in bread of 0 0.08 milligrams per kilo, an uh, average person of 70 kilos could eat more than 370 loaves of bread every day over their lifetime without exceeding the safe levels of dietary glyphosate exposure. <laughs> um, and, I mean, that that doesn't... It's crazy. It's crazy. And I just don't understand how they can make that claim. Yeah, it's it, it, it seems very bizarre. And this one here, um, the single detection of glyphosate in infant cereal at 0 0.011 milligrams per kilo at this concentration, an infant of average body weight um, could, at nine kilograms could consume over 2,000 servings or 242 kilograms of infant cereal every day <laughs> over several years without exceeding the safe levels of glyphosate. It sounds like a comedy, really. Yeah, it's interesting how they, they really reassure the person who wants to believe what they're saying, but, um, but I think they're wrong. I mean, I just, you look at in the United States, all these conditions, the obesity, you know, you can track obesity around the world. Uh, based on the amount of glyphosate in the food, I, I find it very compelling. The, the the foods that the the countries when they start to adopt a Western diet and start eating processed foods, they start getting fat around the world. You know, and America mm. has the biggest obesity problem of almost any country. Huge numbers of obese people these days. Yeah, uh, and, and I think it's an endocrine disrupting effect of glyphosate. <clears throat> and and look, you made you made mention of other herbicides, and I talked to David Bushel, who is a, a an agronomist, and he was talking about a range of other chemicals. It's not obviously not just Roundup and glyphosate being used. And atrazine is is being mm, sprayed. atrazine is really bad. Yeah, it, Tyrone it, Hayes. You know, Tyrone Hayes has done studies on tadpoles, and he's shown that male tad, tadpoles exposed to glyphosate become can turn into a female tadpole despite having the XY chromosome. Wow! It, it messes up the sexual development of the tadpole. Very, 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 very potent. And do you see a role of testing or, or in terms of urinary, breast milk, um, or serum testing for glyphosate? I mean, it's, I, is there any role? You said maybe two weeks of consumption, it, it reflects? Right. So it's a little bit, you know, I find it a little bit um, expensive to, to, to do a test that co covers uh, your last two weeks of exposure, right? It's mm -hmm. sort of hard to know how you, how you interpret that. But I'm actually absolutely impressed with these studies that have shown um, correlations between the level in the urine, like the one I mentioned about the, uh, the, the uh, liver problems, fatty liver disease. It was really striking to me that you could see that. And the one with the, with the girl babies, you know, measuring the urinary glyphosate. And there's another study, I think, an NHANES study that showed urinary glyphosate linked to um, increased levels of a particular protein in the blood, I believe, that's associated with uh, neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's and and uh, Alzheimer's, um, this increased uh, level of this of this protein that they like to use to measure that, uh, you know, multiple sclerosis, all these different diseases that have to do with the brain. Um, up high levels of that is an indicator of those diseases, and they found a correlation with the glyphosate exposure in this NHANES study. So that's pretty striking to me, just from mm -hmm. measuring glyphosate in the urine. I'm amazed that. Uh, that that works as well as it does, you know, because it seems like an insensitive uh, measure that's only looking for two weeks. It does. I wouldn't have expected it to have such a good um, ability to see something like that. So that's really amazing to me. Yeah, very interesting. And I guess in, in terms of wrapping wrapping our discussion up, we talked a lot about glyphosate and, and deuterium. How can people kind of maximize or, or minimize their load of glyphosate? And maximize their clearance of, of deuterium in terms of in, improving or, or living in an optimally healthy life. Well, one thing you'll find interesting is that a high animal fat diet is a low deuterium diet. Animal based fats have low deuterium, and butter is a really good uh, source of a low deuterium food. One of the lowest levels of deuterium are found in butter, uh, and, and, and lard, and um, tallow, beef tallow, and pork lard. 
we use butter and lard in our family as our sources of fats. We don't like the uh, vegetable oils, vegetable oils. You know, like canola oil. Of course, many of those are GMO Roundup ready crops, but we don't use any of those um, in, that's our, a, in our diet. That, that's a great, sorry if I to interrupt you, Stephanie, but that's a really great segue that I just reminded I was going to ask you about. I had a, I've had um, both Tucker Goodrich on, um, who you might know of, he's talked extensively about the harms of canola seed oils and, and omega 6 oils. And he mentions that, um, or uh, uh, attributes a major role of their toxicity to the fact that they're rich in linoleic acid, which then is breaking down into these toxic oxalams like 4-hydroxynodanol and the HODE compounds. And um, but basically, Dr. Jacques Cruz ha makes the point that the one of the major reasons they're toxic is actually because of their high deuterium content. So I'm not sure yes. how your pin opinion on that. Yeah, that's that's interesting that he said that. Um, I actually have looked at the enzymes involved with that, and it's extremely interesting because those uh, fatty acids get oxidized in the liver by cytochrome P450 enzymes, and they get turned into endogenous cannabinoids. This is naturally produced um, hormones that behave like the cannabinoids. And on, people are taking all kinds of cannabinoids to deal with various kinds of problems these days. But I think those cytochrome P450 enzymes are suppressed by glyphosate so that the linoic, linoleic acid can't go down that pathway as well because the enzyme is being disrupted by glyphosate. And instead, it goes down a different pathway that involves lipoxygenase. Lipoxygenase is extremely interesting because it takes two hydrogens off of the fat and it makes water. And it replaces those two hydrogens with an oxygen. So it takes an oxygen molecule apart and uh, into two oxygen atoms and it puts one into the fat and takes away two hydrogens to make water. And that water is going to be extremely deuterium depleted because lipoxygenase has a fantastic ability, the best I've ever seen of any enzyme, to select hydrogen over deuterium. So what I think is happening is that there's this real problem with uh, excess deuterium in the water. And, and therefore, the body solution to that is to oxidize these fats using this lipoxygenase. It's, a, it's an enzyme that's activated under stress conditions. So normally, you wouldn't be using that enzyme. But because the body's desperate, for low deuterium water, it has to sacrifice the fats and turn them into these, into these um, lipids that are actually signaling molecules that induce um, inflammation. And this is what happens. You get inf inflammation in the joints because these fatty, fatty acids are being metabolized into these bizarre things that have these O's in there because it's extracting those hydrogens that are low deuterium hydrogen and it's able to, able to use an enzyme that will not do it if it's deuterium. So when the, so you're pulling the hydrogens out of these fats to make the water that's very valuable to the cell to help the mitochondria. And in so doing, you're, you're generating these signaling molecules. And I think those signaling molecules are kind of saying, hey, guys, we've got a problem here with your gym. We've got to do something desperate. And what something desperate is, is to cause all this inflammation because that can help you to produce to turn the water. It, it suggests to me that the body is having these physiological compensation mechanisms. And maybe yes. what we're observing is disease um, is actually the body just physiologically adapting or trying to do the best it can in the face of, exactly. that, of, of a high deuterium. Um, it's diet. making difficult choices because it's desperate, because it sees that if the mitochondria aren't working, there's going to be trouble down the road. So we've got to find some way to help the mitochondria, even if it's going to cause pain and whatnot. You know, we have to do it. Do you, Someone has suggested, I can't remember who, that the presence of visceral fat um, or the deposition of fat internally or ectopically, so not within fat cells, not within the dipocytes, um, you know, around organs and in, in the muscle, mm -hmm. in the liver, reflects um, uh, a that, that process, the body dealing with excess deuterium. Do you know or have you researched anything that might suggest that? Yeah, well, it is interesting that fats are, in fact, a low deuterium food because they're made out of acetate, and acetate actually has a short path back to those hydrogen atoms that, that, that are made hydrogen molecules that are made by the gut microbes. Because the hydrogen molecules, I told you, they become methane. But they can also, there's, there's a microbes, these are acetogenic uh, microbes, that they can take, take hydrogen gas and carbon dioxide and make uh, acetate. And acetate is what they use to build the fats. So that's why the fats are low in deuterium, because they have a very close, they're very close to the source of that deuterium-depleted hydrogen. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. So the fatty acids have low deuterium. So when you are storing a lot of fats, you're storing a, a low deuterium nutrient that your body could use. So it might be that you're putting it in reserve for the situation in which you're so desperate that you've got to, you know, 
uh, start uh, fixing the problem by virtue of chewing up that fat. But I mean, it's, it's interesting that you end up storing it. And I'm not sure exactly why that is, that it gets stored rather than just getting burned right away on, on, on the fly, right? Partly, I think it's actually, I have, I have argued that glyphosate disrupts the ability to get the fats out of the fat, fat cells. So you build these um, fat cells around your middle. Um, normally, they would be uh, asked to release those fats to burn those fats uh, it, under situations where, um, where there's a metabolic problem of some sort, you know, so that you, um, I, how am I trying to say this? I think adrenaline can actually cause those fat cells to want to release their fat, but the enzyme that's involved in releasing the fats has a glycine dependency problem. It has a, uh, a glyphosate susceptibility motif. So it's possible that this lipoxygenase that is, um, that is responsible for breaking down the fats is getting broken by glyphosate, and therefore the fats are not getting broken down. So then they have to be stored because they're not being broken down. Anthony yeah. actually found glyphosate contamination in lipoxygenase that he ordered from a lab. He found high levels of glyphosate contamination in the lipoxygenase. So that enzyme is getting contaminated with glyphosate. And then lipoxygen has a glycine just a sensitivity there because if that there's a glycine that's critical in that molecule, if that gets replaced by glyphosate, the molecule won't work. The enzyme won't work. So it could simply be that glyphosate is disrupting the ability to break down the fats. Yeah, I mean, I, and that would simply just be another mechanism on top of the fact that, um, you know, most of the people eating a standard Australian and a standard American diet are in continual glucose metabolism. They're not fasting. They're not, um, they're eating a high carb diet. So perhaps even, yeah. They're, they're eating they're a diet that's a synthetic foods. I mean, they have none of the natural, you know, there's all these fancy polyphenols and flavonoids, you know, that are contained in plants when you eat the plants. But when you run it through the factory and produce, you know, pure flour and sugar and, um, oil. I mean, it's just a very depleted um, nutrient in terms of all these extra fancy molecules that would normally be there if you ate the whole food. But once you convert it into these processed foods and you have a soy protein bar, there's a lot of nutrition that's missing in that, in that, in that food. Is that, oh, are, you, are you under the impression or is, have you found evidence that processed foods are uniquely enriched in deuterium compared to um, That's an excellent it, question. and I, I wish I knew the answer. It's actually hard to find data on how much deuterium is in foods, I've found. I've only gotten a little bit of uh, information on that. Um, and uh, But sugars are high. Sugars are high in deuterium compared to fats, for sure. And, and coconut oil was one that was low in deuterium. And uh, I mentioned the lard and the, and the butter. And ghee, ghee is very low in deuterium. That's the uh, Indian butter. Uh, G H E E. Did I say that Clarified right? Butter. Yeah, ghee. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's a very good low deuterium nutrient, and so. Um, uh, but I, I don't, uh, I don't know how, enough about everything else to know exactly where. I can predict it based on you know, you know one that's probably low is is choline. Choline is interesting because that's an animal based uh, nutrient. It's got three methyls attached to the nitrogen atom in choline. And those methyls have a quick path back to methionine. Methionine has a quick path back to those hydrogen atoms, the hydrogen molecules, which means that that uh, choline is going to have low deuterium because it's got those three methyls that all come from methionine. Anything that comes from methionine is going to have low deuterium. Assuming that the methionine is natural, by the way, I actually have been reading, I remember reading some time ago about a, um, the notion that methionine deficiency would lead to longevity. Have you heard that? That's a really uh, the, wild. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's been got that hypothesis has been knocking around for a while, I, I, I believe. Yeah, I think I figured it out. And this is only recently that I thought I had an aha moment on that because uh, methionine. So I, I, I went back and looked at a study on rats where they showed methionine deficiency causing the rats to be able to live longer. I thought that's really crazy because methionine is a central nutrient, right? How can this be? Wouldn't you say? I was really puzzled when I first read it. And there are people who are trying to avoid methionine, you know, just to, to live longer. But what happens, those rats were fed synthetic amino acids that were made in the chemistry lab. All the amino acids that they were fed were made in the chemistry lab. And then they gave a different amount. So they had the control group got these synthetic amino acids and they got lots of methionine, synthetic methionine. The, the treatment group got much less synthetic methionine. And so they were forced to make methionine using their gut microbes, the, the treatment group. So what happened was they made methionine that was healthy, that had low deuterium on that methyl group, whereas the methionine they were eating that was synthetic did not. So when you take a drug, people are taking supplements of amino acids, 
and they're probably all synthetic because they they don't it's a lot of work to have some you know have some e coli make a make a, a molecule and harvest it and try to get rid of everything else that's there that's really hard so when they sell these supplements those are typically made in the chemistry lab the glycine the methionine everything so when you're taking methionine as a supplement you're taking a methionine that's high in deuterium that doesn't have that deuterium depletion property and now you're distributing all those methyls all over your body putting them on the dna molecules everywhere and now you're basically delivering a high deuterium nutrient to your mitochondria when your body's expecting it to be low. So I think when you do methionine deficiency in the way the rats did it, the reason why they're healthier is because they were, their gut microbes were forced to make methionine to supply them with it. And that was healthy methionine. Fascinating. And it's really pointing to the centrality of, of deuterium in, in human disease and well, not only human, but um, mamma mammalian disease in, in general. And it's definitely mm -hmm. a topic that I, I really want to delve a bit bit further into. It, it's also a call to uh, research. If we if anyone has data about deuterium content in food, that would be very helpful because I think... Yeah, I would love it if people would measure it because I think it's doable, but it's not easy. And there's only been a few. Uh, and I have also seen some deuterium levels in, uh, in fluids, body fluids. So, for example, breast milk has low deuterium, and that's not surprising at all, right? Because that's what the infant needs, low deuterium. So breast milk, even milk in general, is a low deuterium nutrient. And um, blood has some intermediate level, lower than uh, seawater, but not too much lower typically. And then sal sal saliva from salivary glands. The salivary glands are able to secrete deuterium-rich water. So we're trying to get rid of the deuterium through the saliva. And my guess is the urine would also be deuterium-rich, but I haven't been able to find any data on that. Yeah. It, so body it, secretions, it, maybe the sweat too, you know, sweat, the urine, the sal saliva. I suspect yeah. they would all be higher. That makes sense. Indeterm. It makes sense, doesn't it? And um, I talked to Dr. Sarah Pugh about this, and she kind of prescribes her clients a low deuterium diet that's rich in, in animal mm -hmm. fats. And, and, and that's mm -hmm. what I see in terms of the effectiveness of carnivore and low carb diet is when we're replacing all the seed oils and the carbs with healthy animal fats and, and protein and uh, uh, prefer preferably well raised organic regenerative then uh, people are going to naturally get a deuterium depleted diet. And, and I guess that's that, that, that's the point of efficacy that um, people point to. And some people say it's because it's a low insulin diet. If they're looking at it from a metabolic and biochemical point of view, from a quantum mm -hmm. point of view, people say it's deuterium. And in, in any case, I think the message is pretty clear, which is don't eat processed foods. Don't eat processed omega-6 mm -hmm. uh, oils or seed oils. Yeah, and, right. um, <laughs> and buy food as locally as you can, and that's that's kind of the message that I give to to people. Yeah, and then I look for the certified organic label. At least in the United States, we have that label, and it's pretty common. It's pretty popular. Certified mm -hmm. organic. I don't know how much you have that in Australia. Yeah, look, there, we do have some labeling systems, but my, my, my advice is always to kind of meet meet your farmer, and. I like that too. Yes, my husband's yeah, that... picking up the vegetables at the farm right now, so we have a, a source from a farm. Yeah, because you, and we eat a lot of salad. Yeah, salads are good. You can you can um you can like look someone in the the farmer's not going to lie to you. I mean, I I've talked to farmers. I'm like I said to them straight up, are you are you spraying glyphosate? And he's like, well, to be honest, we use it on the camphor laurels around the um creek, like just to kill some invasive mm -hmm. trees. But that's the only like we don't spray it. We just you know, kind of like drill into the tree trunk and inject you know put some in there. But they're not using it you know, come on the pastures. So I think that process of vetting is so important. And I think that is how, mm -hmm. as consumers, we, we actually change this whole food system, which is voting with our dollars, buying locally, demanding products that are free from herbicide and pesticide usage. Um, in my mind, that's how this thing kind of changes. I think so. I think it's going to happen bottom up grassroots rather than from the regulatory process because the governments are so terribly bought by the industry that they won't budge unless it's a revolution that people demand it to the point where they can't ignore it anymore. I have a friend, Zen Honeycutt, who, who runs, a, who is a founder of Moms Across America, which is an, or, a, 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 an organization that's promoting healthy eating and has a big message on glyphosate. And she's been measuring glyphosate contamination in various foods. She says, and, and um, really um, exciting that she's been doing this. The government should be doing it, but she did a whole study on school lunches and found lots of glyphosate in the school lunches. And, and just recently she did a study on fast food. So she got a lot of different fast food samples from different um, 
fast food restaurants, and she uh, found 100% of the samples had glyphosate, measurable amounts of glyphosate in them, 100%. And some of them had shockingly high levels. So she actually went to the government and had a hearing. You know, she's very um, determined to get that message out, and she supports this whole idea of just uh, teaching mothers to, to eat healthy, to give their children healthy food, to tell their neighbors, tell their family, you know, you've got to stop eating this processed food and you have to eat certified organic, you have to eat whole foods. That messaging is something very strong in her campaigns. And she's, she's really a great person who's been helping to get the message out to people in America. And we need more people like that um, to advocate for healthy eating. And, and it's just so important not to eat those processed foods to buy whole foods and to cook at home, you know, to spend the time to cook. Cooking is not such a painful task. And it's just, we've been taught that we have more better things to do than just waste time in the kitchen. And we should not be thinking that way. Yeah, look, it's unfortunate that it's the people with the lowest health literacy and socioeconomic standing that are often um, most um, in the position to be buying processed foods and the least in the position to be buying organic or regeneratively raised produce. But I guess it's a yeah, it's a process of of, of trying to make change on, on a small scale and, and hopefully that selection or that um, economic incentive and pressure will then make it the norm that, that there's less glyphosate in the system um, for people who perhaps don't have the time or the knowledge or the inclination to um, to, to, to do this kind of research them, uh, themselves. Yeah, it's a it's going to be a long ride, and I really hope that. I feel hopeful because I think more and more people know about glyphosate and more and more people are choosing to eat organic. We're seeing more and more organic food showing up on the on the shelves of the regular grocery stores these days. You know, Costco has a, a lot of organic food that they sell here in America, uh, but even just the regular grocery stores are selling more and more certified organic, so that's exciting to see. Definitely, definitely. And um, what would you say in terms of, well, and I'll, I'll just share my quick thoughts on, on it. I find that eating a low carb diet is particularly effective because you immediately. Gonna, I, I like low carb. Yeah, you're going to get yes, rid of I any of, of the most glyphosate contaminated foods, which is those cereals um, and the legumes. Exactly. And, yes, and, and and also animal based foods because the animals have uh, have nutrients that are very important, even like cholesterol, a very important nutrient that's only found in animal based foods, not in plants. People think cholesterol is toxic, but actually, it's essential for the brain. Yeah, and that's that's another whole rabbit hole, and and that we could go down. But yeah, I agree. It's a, it is a fundamental building block of the cell. But it, but yeah, essentially, animal based diet, a carnivore diet, is a low glyphosate diet. It is exactly. a low it is a low deuterium diet, and so we can yes. see why carnivore is so effective is because you're getting a minimal amount of uh, what we've just spent an hour and a half describing is, is <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> not, not compatible with optimal um, biological and mitochondrial mm-hmm. function. So. Um, that's a great kind of way of framing it, I think. Yes, I agree. And, and, and maybe finally, Stephanie, I think there's a group that might be useful to have a message for, and that's the farmers, because the farmers are the ones who are actually growing the food, and they're the ones who are, making, um, who, who are having an, an economic model, and whether that's a personal economic model, that relies on the purchase and use of glyphosate on these industrial scales so and um, what what would you say to a farmer whose livelihood relies on and um, planting massive tracts of, of crop commodity crop and and as part of that process spraying it with herbicides like glyphosate it's actually really problematic right now because it's so difficult to get to the other side of the fence because once you've been using glyphosate every year a study in brazil showed that the glyphosate levels in the in the soil were going up every year it wasn't getting removed, you know, it was accumulating in the soil where they had GMO Roundup Ready crops. So you've got soil that's very toxic at this point. It's got depleted nutrients, you know, depleted minerals. It's not healthy and it's lost organic matter. Uh, the bacteria are broken. The, the earthworms are, be, are getting Parkinson's disease from glyphosate exposure. So nothing's good in the soil. And now you want to go certified organic. Well, you can't just on a dime just decide, okay, now we're going to go organic you got to fix your soil first, and that can take years. So you're in a limbo place where you can't sell certified quite organic, even though you're not using glyphosate anymore. I think the government should be subsidizing these farmers for the process of converting to certified organic, which takes years because they have to fix their soil first. And if they do work on you know, even adding probiotics to the soil, you know, in the minerals, the probiotics, 
the organic matter, all of these things are missing from the soils after many years of using glyphosate. So you need to fix the soil. And once you fix the soil, then the crop is actually more resistant to the insects because it's healthier. Just like us, we're healthier when we eat good nutrition and the crop is healthier when it's got healthy soil. So you've got to work on it. As you say, regenerative, and you've been saying that word many times, that is so important. Regenerative agriculture, where you're actually renewing the soil, improving the health of the soil with every crop that you grow. And, and so over time, your soil becomes very rich and then your crop becomes very sturdy and resistant to both to drought, you know, and to, uh, to insects. And, and then the weeds um, aren't as able to get a hold because the crop is so strong. And so I think there's a, a, a win in, in fixing the soil and then growing crops that are, you'll have more yield as well because the crop is so healthy. And so I think all of that's going to work well to work and it's going to help the climate as well. Glyphosate is actually affecting climate change by disrupting a nitrogen uptake into the crops. It messes up the nitrogen um, fixing the bacteria. And then you, you apply these nitrate fertilizers and they wash off because the soil is so unable to hold things. So the nitrate fertilizers wash off into the waterways and then they become nitrous oxide, which is a really bad greenhouse gas uh, in the waterways. And of course, they mess up other things in the waterways as well with these toxic chemicals, but it's... Uh, Glyphosate itself is a source of nitrogen. So when glyphosate washes off into the waterways and gets broken down by the cyanobacteria, that's going to release nitrogen. It's going to become nitrous oxide. So you've got a, a lot of problems, I think, with glyphosate. And, and our, our, our industry, industrial-based agriculture is actually increasing uh, the problem of global climate change. So if we reverse back to regenerative, we can trap carbon in the soil. That's also really important, trapping carbon in the soil. When you have disruption of these... Um, of these enzymes that grab the methane and turn it back into organic mo molecules and stuff it into the soil, that's going to have more carbon in the air and you're going to have more carbon dioxide uh, problems, which is going to be a greenhouse gas again. So the carbon dioxide, the methane, and, and the nitrous oxide are all really nasty greenhouse gases. And because of the disruption, probably in the plants as well, of the ability to trap those gases and turn them into organic matter is going to increase the risk of climate change. Yeah, and you know, I like to call it degenerative agriculture, which is the modern industrial high <laughs> <laughs> high input and monocropping, strip mining the soil. And Stephanie's just did an amazing job of explaining all the some of the facets of why it's so destructive, and really kind of loops us back to the beginning of our discussion, which is this is the topsy turvy world we're in, where um, we're simply just um, nuking the soil, and we're nuking the microbial diversity and our ability to feed ourselves with with the nutrients in the soil with endless applications of of these herbicides like glyphosate and then synthetic uh fertilizers and and, and the whole time we're just chasing our tails and collectively becoming poorer and poorer in terms of soil diversity and and uh, nutrients and and you, you 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 gave us the answer which i agree with completely with regenerative agriculture and uh, i think my solution is to get um, more cattle on on this land and 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 even yes. though, as you said, it's it's we can't call that land um, organic um, for a while. At least there's an intermediary between the human food and the the glyphosate, which is the ruminant herbivore. And um, I, I don't know. I don't know of any science. Maybe you know. Is there is there an effect of of grazing these cattle on um, glyphosate laden pasture? I mean. Um, is it bioaccumulating in their adipose fat tissue, or do you do you have any information about that? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, we're, we're the cows in America, the CAFO cows that are being fed the GMO Roundup ready corn and soy, so they've got a really nasty high glyphosate diet in America, and they're very sick. The cows mm. in America have a lot of problems. But mm. putting them on the pasture, um, I would hope the pasture doesn't have glyphosate. I don't know if you guys have a lot of glyphosate resistant grass or anything like that, but. I know there I, is uh, there is GMO glyphosate resistant grass, but I don't think it's too, used too much. No, I don't um, think glyphosate oh, is the, the herbicide of choice for the pasture. No, it isn't. Yeah, so I think the cows are not really getting glyphosate and, and when they graze on, on, on the grass. grass. But the thing is, there's many parts of, um, of the world that are grasses that are in places where it's not a good soil to grow crops in and it's not enough rain. You know, grass is a very hardy plant that can grow on almost any kind of environment and then cows can eat grass so that's actually really important that cows can eat grass because we can't we can't digest grass but cows turn the grass into really healthy nutrients for us and if they're not being exposed to glyphosate they can take that methane gas and turn it into deuterium depleted nutrients instead of making it released into the environment and causing 
climate change, you know? Yeah. They can bring it back into deuterium depleted nutrients. And so um, that becomes very beneficial. And then the cows, of course, fertilize the grass too. And then when they graze on the grass, all of everything the cows do helps the grass to become hardy and healthy. So the grass becomes more drought resistant. You know, everything becomes good for the grass when the cows are grazing on it. It's a natural ecosystem that's very beneficial to the earth. Yeah, Mother, Mother Nature perfected the technology um, over millions of years. And only in the past 50, 60, 70 have we thought we're smarter than her and managed to uh, screw up everyone's health in not only ours, but the ecosystems and I know, it's really <laughs> terrible. We're too so, smart for our own good. You know, we know how to do all these things, but we don't understand the consequences. Yes. We don't look for the long-term consequences and we just assume everything's going to be fine. It's not. It's, uh, it's, it's a pessimistic, but it's also very optimistic. And, I, and I'm seeing more and more people being empowered by, by meeting their farmers and, and buying regeneratively raised beef so, and, and taking charge of their health. So I think I'm, I'm very optimistic about it. And um, Stephanie, thanks for, for a very interesting and in-depth and wide-ranging um, conversation. Where, where can people uh, follow your work or read your scientific papers? Um, maybe, maybe somewhere they, they can read everything that we've referenced um, in terms of the topics we've discussed. Yeah, I mean, you can go to YouTube and t type my name and you can find a bunch of YouTube interviews. I've done a lot of interviews over the years. Um, and I have a, a website, stephaniesenef.net, um, that you can go to get my, and it'll show you where you can buy my book um, and just search my name. Senef is a, is a pretty rare name. So if you can remember Senef, search it on the web, you'll find a lot of stuff. So <laughs> Fantastic. I do have several papers that are posted on the MIT webpage, but, and there's a link to that on my stephaniesenef.net. <laughs> Okay, fantastic. Well, well, yeah, I'll include, include that information. So um, thanks very much for your time. Um, any any parting thoughts or things that you want to leave the listener with? Well, I just hope that people heed the message about deuterium and recognize the need for um, changing their, their strategy for how to stay healthy by eating certified organic, eating high animal-based foods. Um, I, I didn't, we didn't mention this, but high sulfur-containing foods because sulfur is really important for good health. Um, is another thing that I advocate. And I also advocate getting out in the sunlight as much as possible. Sunlight is very healthy for your, for your body. Yes, and um, will help with that deuterium depletion process. So Exactly. <laughs> great. Thank uh, you. On that note, well, uh, thanks, thanks a lot, Stephanie, um, and have a great day. You too. Great talking to you.